This video is powered by the pros at Pascal Air Plumbing and Electric. Arkansas owned, Arkansas operated. GoPascal.com. Connor, we kind of, you know, last week we did a lot of making fun of the Aggies. Um, we questioned their offense. Uh, we questioned Jimbo Fisher as a coach. And, you know, football's a funny game sometimes. And I don't think Saturday, to Razorback fans, it was funny ha-ha at all. And we're kind of left picking up the pieces of one of those games that you just walked out of thinking, how the heck did that happen? So from your perspective, what was it that you saw? Well, first of all, great Red Hot Chili Peppers reference. Watching Woodstock 99, it kind of made me a little bit skeptical of their impact on the entire debacle that was. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Um, Mm -hmm. Saturday night for, for Arkansas had a couple of Woodstock 99 vibes to it because you, you're just sitting there wondering, how did this happen? Because this was, in my opinion, a pretty favorable spot to be able to, to have, to, to, to be able to rectify those issues that they've had defending the pass against an A&M passing offense that really has not been very good. And I Smith, their best receiver, fractures his leg in the game, uh, albeit late when they had kind of already done their damage. And, you know, the way that Arkansas came out, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, this is, this is going to be a 28-point game. And instead, Arkansas was, in my opinion, a bit shell-shocked after the KJ fumble. And for the record, I don't think he scores even if he holds on to the football. I think he took off a little bit too early there. Um, but I do think that, that that moment changed everything. And it changed the way that Arkansas – was moving the football, and their offense rhythm was gone after that. And that's why A&M scored 23 consecutive points. They had a gritty performance when a lot of people were laughing at them, myself included, after the App State game, and they deserve a lot of credit. Yes, it was a game that could have been different if Cam Little's kick drifts a little bit to the left, maybe a little bit up. Who knows? But A&M is able to come away with a a very hard-fought victory. Yeah, I, I think that fumble return was like the Fred Durst moment where things just sort of exploded yep. on stage and you couldn't recover from that, you know. And, I mean, we're, we're in this position where, you know, you want to people want to point a finger at this unit or that unit for why the game was lost, you know. I mean, and, and I just think it came down to uh, it's not like the Aggies made a ton of plays offensively. They made enough plays defensively. To, to win this game. And Arkansas's defense, for as many uh, splash plays as we saw for the first three weeks, there, there weren't as many of them, if any, you know, to speak of after the first quarter against Texas A&M. And, and I think, like, Max Johnson impressed me just with his elusiveness. It wasn't his throwing or, or, or his speed or anything like that. I felt like he stepped out of four or five sacks, and that was a huge thing. Yeah, that, that's the... The, the MO with Max Johnson, he is who he is at this point of his career. I don't necessarily think you're going to look at him and say, wow, that's an all SEC type of guy. Um, but he does those little things over the course of the game to give you a chance. And that's what A&M needed. I mean, there was that one play, I, I think he was third down or whatever, where he escaped like three different guys. And you're like, how did Max Johnson just find a way out of that to be able to keep that play alive with his legs? And he didn't have the turnover. And when you're facing that kind of pressure and you are able to be, um, you're able to play a clean game, that's key. I mean, even the little, the little play where, you know, their first touchdown on the game where Barry Odom sends that all out blitz and Max Johnson knows he's about to get his bell rung and he floats that ball to Evan Stewart in the end zone. And that's a true freshman that's making a good adjustment on the football albeit a five-star true freshman, and he makes that adjustment on the football, and that's kind of what got A&M going a little bit. And, you know, actually, even if you want to kind of pull it back and what allowed them to get back into the game, Kendall Brown's getting maybe a little bit too cute with the two call plays from Malik Hornsby. That slowed down Arkansas's offensive momentum before that K.J. fumble ever happened because they were up 14 to nothing, driving in A&M territory on the 38-yard line, and all of a sudden they can't even get into field goal range and they're able to, to punt the ball away, and then, boom, just like that, Devon A-Chain has a 63-yard run on the first play right after that. So there are a lot of key little things that happened over the course of that game that I think squandered it for Arkansas. Let's move over to you know the other big SEC game uh, that game day featured, and Tennessee comes out on top against the Florida Gators in a game where both quarterbacks just put on a complete show, both with their legs, with their arms, 
You know, I know Richardson, over 450 passing yards. Hendon Hooker accounted for like over 470 yards of offense. And I get, I mean, we can't say Tennessee is a clear cut second place team in, in the East right now because Kentucky remains undefeated. So, but it was a huge step forward for Tennessee, certainly with game day there too. Huge. Absolutely huge. And, you know, I've, uh, I've talked a lot about Hendon Hooker and you know comparing him uh, with the rest of the SEC quarterbacks, and I put him I put him just ahead of KJ for for a while now. I've had Hendon at two and KJ at three, and Saturday confirmed a lot of what I've been saying about him throughout this off season about how comfortable he is at the offense and how many different things he can do to beat you, and that is just such a dangerous offense to have to face for sixty minutes, even when they don't have their best receivers. Cedric Tillman was out that game. And if you were watching that game without that knowledge, you would have never known. And so we we got a really fun back and forth game with two extremely talented quarterbacks. But to me, this is all about Hendon Hooker having that that comfortability in the offense. You kind of see if you're an Arkansas fan what it looks like when KJ gets rolling, and it looks like he and Kendall Bryles are kind of on that same level. We're seeing that with Hendon and Josh Heupel in the way that they are really trusting that that system is going to be able to scheme guys open. And Hendon's going to be able to make those plays. And if not, when it breaks down, he's really fun to watch in the open field when he's able to make things happen with his legs. So, yeah, I, I don't think it, it feels like 98 for Tennessee. I'm not saying that. But I think this is a New Year's Six Bowl team. And, and I think that they have the ability to do that. they got a big one coming up after the bye against LSU that will let us know kind of where exactly this program is at. Hendon Hooker right now, fifth in the nation in total offense, fifth in the nation in yards per pass attempt eighth in the nation in passing efficiency and 13th in completion percentage. This is a guy who's putting together a, uh, a fantastic season. Now, on the flip side, there was a game there where nobody wanted to win. Auburn and Mizzou. Hogs get them both. And it's <laughs> that was as ugly as it got. Now, I know that um, Auburn is now in their third string center. Uh, there was an injury to the second stringer that he walked out. It was a, an arm injury. looked awful. Mizzou lost their right tackle as he was trying to cover uh, an interception, and but both offenses kind of were running the football up until that, and then there was zero offense to speak of uh, in the final half until, I mean, it's like Mizzou just did not want to win that game, Connor. Neither team did. Uh, they, they didn't. I, I, I made the joke. I, I think I could have walked out there with my podcast co-host, Will Ogburn, and we could have asked politely, um, can we please win this game? The, the two of us, we as a podcast, can, can we win this game? And I think they would have just given it to us. It was that bad. I, I mean, I, I, I've seen some bad offensive showings, but what we saw in the second half of that game with both teams and their inability to move the ball, I mean, it was just death. It was like a, you know, you, you go to basketball games where it just seems like there's a, a lid on top of the hoop. And this was that. I mean, Harris Amoebus, thicker kicker, all American could make a 26 yarder from right down the pipe, right down the pipe. You Drinkwitz was so um, unconfident in his offense that they got the ball on the three yard line before that. And they said, Nope, we can't even trust that we're going to be able to successfully hand the ball off in these spots and not even necessarily get a touchdown, but just hand the ball off and try. I'd rather take three knees here and give the ball to my all American kicker who then somehow missed that kick. Yeah, it was terrible. It set football back probably 30 years. Brian Harson, in my opinion, would have been fired if he had lost that game. He's able to keep his job. It's delaying the inevitable. That's a bad football team. They're both bad football teams. They, they just are. It's as clear as that. And look, I said in the preseason that I thought Auburn could, could beat Arkansas. I'm having some second thoughts about that one. Absolutely, mm-hmm. because they don't have any offensive identity with Robbie Ashford as, as the starter. And after those first you know those first two drives where they get the running game going it was just a total disaster they, they both right now both of those programs look like they have no answers whatsoever offensively connor, <clears throat> connor it is truly bad i mean i was down in florida for a wedding and you know right there in the pan so still a lot of alabama influence i was sitting next to auburn fans who were clearly auburn fans had their gear on rooting against their team because they want to see yep. brian harson gone that bad and I didn't believe that was a real thing until I saw it with my eyes. And there's a lot of bad football teams out there. And one of them just fired their coach, probably one of the worst teams, especially after what we saw Ole Miss do to them last week uh, in Atlanta. What kind of faith do you have in Georgia Tech to get the right guy? And is there a right guy 
out there for the rambling wreck of Georgia Tech's program. Yeah, I, I, it's a really interesting opening that I think is going to have SEC implications. I, I really do. I, I think this could be somebody with SEC ties, whether that's Bill O'Brien, the Alabama offensive coordinator, whether it's Dan Mullen coming out of the ESPN booth to to, to take a job like this. Uh, maybe we, we could see we could see somebody like uh, maybe maybe a Jeff Levy or somebody that's really interesting, a Charles Huff, Jamie Chadwell coming from Coastal Carolina. I think this job is fascinating. Deion Sanders is the one that's that's the biggest name possible that you can throw off for a job like this. But it's really interesting because they're right in the heart of that SEC footprint, uh, playing those games, obviously playing their home games in Atlanta. But I do think that we're we're talking about a, uh, a place that has just been absolutely lost with Jeff Collins. I mean, I watched that game against Ole Miss, and you're just like, how are they this bad? Mm. How, like, I, I don't even know if Ole Miss is, is really good. And to, for Ole Miss to win that game 42 to nothing, whatever it was, you're just like, how is it this bad so soon? And even against Clemson, where you're just like, oh, man, they don't have any offensive promise whatsoever. Maybe it's the result of trying to change over from the post-Paul Johnson era and you're trying to modernize that offense. I don't know what it is. That's kind of why Jamie Chadwell would make a little bit of sense with his modern concepts with what they do with the option but and still being able to throw the ball. But it, it is a really interesting opening that I think a lot of SEC fans will be dialed into. And you bring up Ole Miss, and they had a close one, a lot closer than they thought it was going to be against uh, against Tulsa. Who should be more worried this week after what they saw last week? Is it can is it Ole Miss with what they saw against Tulsa, or is it or is it Kentucky with what they saw against NIU? I think it's Ole Miss, um, and I realize Ole Miss is a six and a half point favorite, but Kentucky gets Chris Rodriguez back, and that's going to be so big for that team because they need him. Their ground game is bad. Guys, they're averaging one more yard on the ground per game than Mississippi State, like the air raid team who throws the ball 50 times a game. Kentucky, yeah, Kentucky. Big blue wall has not been much of a wall this year mm-hmm. for that offensive line. It's been pretty rough, and Will Levis is getting hit too much. They need Chris Rodriguez back, and he's going to have a huge boost. But, yeah, I do have questions about Ole Miss because you see that game against Tulsa where – like they're they're just a roller coaster from quarter to quarter. Ole Miss can look like a team that could run on the eighty five Bears one quarter, and then the next quarter they're like, oh yeah, once they get a penalty, it's it's pretty rough. And then Jackson Dart starts forcing throws, and you're wondering where this offense is going to come from. And I think defensively, you know, they still have a lot of questions to answer. They really haven't faced a good offense yet, at least not at the Power Five level. Um, so, yeah, I have questions about Ole Miss. I think they're the team that is going to have more of kind of an eyebrow raise for me. And if they're able to, to come out of that with a, a really solid win against Kentucky, maybe we'll start to, to give them a little bit more love. But I'm, I'm very much in wait-and-see mode for a program that had 30 new faces that they're trying to all blend together. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's probably Ole Miss, the, the team that I have a little bit more questions about. Connor, let's end on a thought on Arkansas, Alabama, 2.30 CBS Saturday, 15 straight losses to the Crimson Tide for the Razorbacks. Um, and is there anywhere where you feel like Arkansas has an edge? Uh, and, and what sort of chances do you give them to come up with a victory uh, this weekend? There's a chance. Look, Alabama with Bryce Young as a starter, I tweeted this out. They've played five true road games. Four of those games have been one score games, you know, like this belief that Alabama is invincible on the road. I don't know why kind of the odds makers haven't really figured this out yet. They, they haven't been that with Bryce Young as the starter. And I think some of that is because their offensive line isn't very good. And you know what? There are a lot of things that Arkansas can do from a defensive standpoint to get pressure on, on Bryce Young with you know, former Alabama player, Drew Sanders, of course. That that suggests Arkansas can hang around in this game. I mean, it was a one score game last year. I still felt like Alabama was kind of in control of that, but Alabama has played with fire. The stat that I kept bringing up throughout the off season was that last year this team had one score games in the fourth quarter, six of eight times in SEC play. You know, their opportunities are going to be there, and you know, there are opportunities in that Texas game too. So Arkansas is going to to be able to have some chances, I think, with that crowd. Alabama also committing so many penalties on the road. I mean, they committed 15, a Saban-era record in that game against Texas. So I think crowd noise, huge, obviously. And then can can Arkansas wear them down with the ground game? Of course, we need to see that. But I I think Arkansas is going to have a chance late in this one. It's all about what those one or two pivotal plays uh, end up being. Could have said the same thing about the Southwest Classic, isn't it? Don't you feel (laughs) the exact same thing?
Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports, contests, and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports information from live in game betting, props, and futures. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet use our promo code believe 50 to receive your 50 percent welcome bonus on your first deposit that's believe b-l-e-a-v 50 that's believe b-l-e-a-v 5-0 bet online where the game starts